Uh, thanks for uh, joining us again to, today. Uh, for the last uh, couple of uh, presentations, we've had um, some conflicts. Uh, crews had to go to the field, and, and that's the way it goes sometimes in the in the in the spring. So uh, every once in a while, there'll be a change in the uh, in the in the schedule. Um, so today we have a unique presentation uh, that um, will be presented by uh, Anthony Brusa. And I thought it would be a good idea to give the Forever Green Group an update on the work that he is doing around Palmer amaranth and the identification of other weedy species in the soil seed bank and in harvested seed and seed that is being sold for sowing purposes. So he's developing the technology to detect uh, a range of plant species. And today he's going to be talking about his uh, Palmer, Palmer amaranth um, uh, uh, work. So uh, Anthony has led a national team around this issue uh, with Mich a group from Michigan State, Colorado State, and here at the University of Minnesota. And so I've asked him to give us an update on that work and maybe talk a little bit about uh, what's being uh, planned for, for, the, for the future. All right, this is more than just impact on for evergreen crops, but certainly uh, it's an issue that impacts um, all crops being produced um, uh, in, the, in the region and, and uh, especially here in Minnesota as Palmer advances towards Minnesota. And the, as many of you know, we have some populations that have developed in Minnesota and uh, trying to eradicate those and keep others from coming in. And so Anthony's work is key to uh, that early, early detection. So Anthony, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Don, and thank you everyone for attending. I know end of March between field work and deadlines is absolutely crazy. So uh, thank you all for showing up. So as a bit of a change from the usual for evergreen, instead of looking at crops, as Don mentioned, we're looking at weed species, but you'll see it's all still connected with agronomic systems. Uh, so quick outline of what we're gonna be going through. I'll give you the background of what Palmer is and the threats that it poses. And then we'll go into the actual work that I did with developing the new assay. And then some of the potential directions we're planning on taking it in the next few years. So Palmer amaranth, uh, pigweed, careless weed. Most of you have probably heard about this or seen people's eyes go wide with shock when they find out that they have it in a field. Uh, close relative to water hemp, which is also a problem for ag agronomic fields. It is native to southwestern US and northwestern Mexico. So very dry arid environments, which is why we were surprised to see just how far north it's able to spread. So in terms of its overall expansion, this, this image does a good job of showing, you can see light green is its native range and its initial expansion was into the uh, south where it's basically taken hold and it's pretty much everywhere down there. And then more recently, basically after 2000, it started spreading up into the Midwest. And then even more recently, basically 2013 afterwards, it started going as far north as Minnesota and Wisconsin. So why do we care? There's a lot of agronomic weeds that growers have to deal with. What makes Palmer so dangerous? So Palmer is extremely prolific. It produces a massive amount of seeds. I have a quarter of a million listed here. There's estimates that go over half a million from a single individual, depending on the growing conditions. So if you get one of these mature females that set seed, you're already in trouble. It's also extremely fast growing. Under optimal conditions, it can grow two to three inches per day, which enables it to easily overtop a lot of the crop species. You can see down here, that's a picture of a soybean field that's just been entirely overgrown. You can see the top of Palmer just poking over everything. In terms of yield losses, uh, there's been a number of studies. There's rough, uh, the worst case scenario, this is when it goes completely uncontrolled, is a 91% yield loss in corn systems and a 79% yield loss in soybean. It also reduces cotton yield by uh, 53% if you're looking for something a little further south. So it is absolutely catastrophic uh, yield losses when uncontrolled. The grower is not going to be able to take a hit of that much of their yield being lost. And once again, this is what it looks like when it goes completely out of control. This is worst case, uh, just nightmare for one of these growers. 
It also poses a risk to the agronomic export market because when it's harvested, if you got something that looks like this and you're trying to harvest it, that, that seed's gonna end up in your final product. In 2017, China filed a number of complaints against US soybean producers specifically for weed seed contamination in the exports. Uh, agreement was reached on that and there wasn't any further action, but uh, Australian barley imports had a similar issue and all imports were suspended in the middle of 2020 because of seed contamination. So it was a big risk for that. Uh, the USDA handles a lot of the regulation for this, and there's a uh, phytosanitary certification program that is sort of an agreement between the US and a lot of the countries we export to. And that basically certifies that weed seed isn't present in the exports. Uh, so this is a major thing at the, at the international level, being able to say that the thing that you are selling to another country is not going to introduce Palmer or another species into that country. Uh, as far as Palmer uh, control, there's also the issue of herbicide resistance, and it's probably not going to surprise anyone. Weed species really like to develop herbicide resistance very, very rapidly. If you look at this uh, figure here, the one that probably stands out to most of you is there's a lot of orange dots on it, and that is EPSPS inhibitors, also known as glyphosate. So glyphosate resistant is this just completely widespread. You can find it pretty much across the entire country. Um, other ones that are very common are ALS inhibitors and PPO inhibitors. Those are very common in Palmer. But we also see photosystem 2 inhibitors and HPPD inhibitors popping up occasionally. Uh, basically, over the last 50 years, we've just seen this rapid expansion of Palmer amaranth. And most notably, you see right around 2005 to uh, 2015, that is the group nine, that's glyphosate resistance, just absolutely exploding in amaranthus as a genus, mostly Palmer, also in water hemp. And just to give you sort of an overview, uh, a lot of the literature that's out there, you can see glyphosate resistance reported very, very frequently. There's the ALS and PPO. And important thing to note is if you look at certain ones, like for example, um, Schwartz Lazaro down here, there's three different resistances that's in a single population. So we see these multiple resistance types emerging as well, where you have Palmer that has two, three, even five potential herbicide resistance traits in a single population. Usually it's glyphosate and ALS and PPO, but you'll occasionally find some of those other ones popping up as well. So the worst case scenario that we have seen that has actually been reported and verified uh, in Kansas and in Arkansas, we had populations that had five resistance mechanisms. And at that point, you're running out of tools to be able to use. So what are the non-herbicide control options? Because herbicide resistance is popping up so much. Well, I mean, tillage does work, but I don't think I need to tell the Forever Green group that we probably don't want to be relying on tillage. There's a number of problems with that. So what else can you do? Well, we're forever green. What about cro cover crops? There's been some work done with cover crops for Palmer amaranth control um, relatively recently. There hasn't been too much done, but two papers that came out within the past few years showed that cereal rye was fairly effective at controlling Palmer. Uh, the best results that they found was around 80% control of Palmer. Uh, but the other approach is, at least for the case of Minnesota, is prevent it from taking hold. And when it does get us, you know, when it does get introduced, detect it early and remove it so that it doesn't become established and become a continuing threat. So how do you do that? Well, we, I basically break this down into sort of three different perspectives of how we provide a service to the growers of uh, Minnesota. So at the regulatory level, the Department of Ag is, uh, you know, is putting in all the rules and restrictions and enforcement of what's allowed to come into the state. So the Minnesota weed seed law, for example. We have our outreach group, so uh, Extension does a great job of getting the news out there so people know to look for Palmer and to report it, which has been extremely important. And then the research side of things, which is you know obviously me, but also our collaborators over at Colorado State who are developing the tools that we can use basically behind the scenes to allow everything else to work. So the state, for Minis uh, the state of Palmer in Minnesota uh, it was originally introduced through the CRP planting, so basically native pollinator mixes. That was back in 2016, it was first discovered. So at this point, we're looking at, you know, not even five years it's been around, but it's been a major priority for those five years. And really, this, this is the stage where your control efforts have the most impact. 
And I mentioned how important it is to get the word out there. Every single sighting of Palmer Amaranth in the state of Minnesota at this point has been found by a grower or a crop consultant or someone who actually works the field, walking out there and actually finding it and saying, hey, this doesn't belong here, let me contact somebody. So our, our education efforts, uh, you know, MDA and Extension have done an amazing job about that. And the reason that we are able to keep Palmer under control at this point is because of that. Uh, MDA also has some excellent resources using the GIS system that you can use to sort of visualize what the state of Palmer is. Um, so here's a quick shot. This was the most recent update for introductions in Palmer in the state. And you can see all of, unfortunately, they used a really, really light yellow. But all that yellow is counties where Palmer was introduced and is currently uh, been controlled. It's still under monitoring because you have to monitor for five years after it's been removed. And then our most recent introductions in orange are the ones that are still going remediation and control efforts. You can see all the way down in the southeast, the two counties down there. Uh, you can also use other, other layers there, for example, what was the source of introduction? And a lot of these were the CRP plantings. That seems to be the big one. But we have agronomic seed, that's an introduction point, and we have manure. I know that there was a shipment of uh, sunflower husks that was being used as cattle feed, and that was an introduction route as well. And of course, the most recent ones down in the Southeast, once again, we don't quite know what they are. Investigations are still continuing. But to give you a quick overview of how Palmer is getting around, we had the native seed mixes. Those are the first introductions in the state. But agricultural seed, um, soybean, sunflower, common ones, uh, not for Minnesota, but North Dakota had a big issue with contaminated millet that was planted. And six different fields got contaminated that way. So all of those, because they're seed-based, are regulated by the Minnesota seed law. We also have the issue of contaminated equipment that's not being properly cleaned, being brought into the state and being shared across fields. And there's a possibility of animal feces. So Dr. Wilson is doing work right now to investigate that. Um, and Don has mentioned in the past, there's a possibility of waterfowl spreading it as well. Those latter three are ones that specifically affect our agronomic systems. So this is what, the, the growers are concerned about this is what Forever Green ties into is how do we prevent Palmer it from affecting these economically important systems. In order to protect field crops, you really need early identification. So that's where this whole project comes in. How do you identify Palmer amaranth when you find it either in the field or in seed form? And this is a good example of why we need that. This, it, these are all amaranths. On the left is Palmer. The middle is Powell's amaranth. On the right is spiny amaranth. And if you're just walking out in the field and you find one of these, the average person's not gonna be able to tell the difference between these. I mean, even someone who works in weed species will have a tough time unless you specifically get down and look for very, very minute details. So there's a lot of things you can find out there in the field. And the question is, what do we have? But there's also the question of, you get a bunch of seed that looks like this, and there's no way you can morphologically identify this. I mean, this is just, a bunch of tiny little things about a millimeter in size. So in order to get a proper identification, you need genetic testing. So our goal for this project was basically two steps. First was to design genetic markers that we knew would be able to identify specifically Palmer amaranth uh, as compared to other amaranth species. Uh, because Palmer specifically has a lot of restrictions on it by the state, but you know, water hemp, for example, doesn't. Um, and then once we've designed these markers to actually assess what the performance of the markers is, both for use of a plant you find in the field, but also doing bulk seed testing, you know, what you pull from the combine or what you pull from a package of seed that's intended to be planted. So the underlying principle behind this is that we need to find some sort of a genetic basis that we can use to identify Palmer against everything else. So in order to find this, we use uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP. So this is an alignment of Palmer at the top along with a bunch of other related species. And specifically, you can see in this position here, Palmer always has an A and a G, and every other species has a C and then an A. So this is a double SNP at this point. But if we can find what the state of Palmer is in this position, we can tell whether or not our sample is Palmer. So the overall outline for the project was collect as broad of a sampling of Palmer and the other amaranths as we could in order to make sure we had proper geographic representation, find those target SNPs that we could use for identification, design the markers, and then test them.
So in order to obtain the plant tissue, we use the uh, greenhouse to grow them. This is Amaranthus ploitoides, by the way. And we got most of our material supply from the Germplasm Resources Information Network. If you've ever used it, they're extremely, extremely good source of seed from across the country. Uh, we also reached out to a number of, uh, of colleagues who happened to have interactions with Palmer and got some seed from them. And on the bottom right, you can see that is uh, just a sense of what the scale is of these Palmer seeds. That's a one millimeter mark on the ruler there. So very tiny. Uh, in terms of our sampling coverage to make sure we have proper representation of everything that was present. We're most interested in Palmer. So we had 20 populations, mostly across the US, but also native range, as well as a few South American and one uh, African stream. Water hemp, which is another high impact uh, pigweed, we had 10 populations. And then all these related species, we had five populations, just to make sure that we had proper coverage and we weren't just looking at one field in Nebraska. So after that, we grew them up in the greenhouse so that we would actually get proper leaf tissue for DNA extraction. Uh, and very important, this is not something you usually have to deal with for evergreen, but because this is a regulated invasive species, you need to make sure that you actually destroy it so that it is not uh, viable tissue after you're done with it. So we made sure that we use an autoclave to just uh, basically cook the heck out of this stuff once we were done with it, make sure that there was no possibility of University of Minnesota being a point of introduction. After that, just in standard DNA extraction, we used the BioSprint for high throughput because we had probably around 3,000 individuals we were extracting DNA from, but you can use pretty much any technique. So once we got our DNA, we had to actually find the target SMPs. How did we do that? We used uh, genotyping by sequence through uh, UMGC, pretty standard approach. Um, used a lot of the standard tools you're familiar with. We used bow tie and BWA. For the alignment, uh, we didn't have the Palmer uh, genome assembly completed at that point. It has been released since, but we had the um, Hypochondriacus genome was the closest that we had for alignment. It still worked quite well. Did some basic screening. We submitted 820 samples, and after QC, 817 of them were kept. So we only lost uh, three, so our DNA was overall good quality. Paired it down to a more reasonable number to work with. And then at that point, we're just uh, feeding it into a custom R script in order to basically figure out within all of these loci that we have, uh, what are the ones where Palmer always has the same state and where do that, what does that differ from every other species? So just a little bit of custom coding there. And we had a list of candidate loci to work with. So once we had our potential targets, we started evaluating where they were in the genome, what the immediate areas around them were to make sure that they bound properly, GC content, um, trying to find TM values that work well with the chemistry. So we uh, devised a total of nine potential candidates and we settled on three of them in, at the end. So how do we actually figure out what the state is of one of these SNPs? So that's what we call genotyping. We did something that was relatively cheap and easy and um, we really only care if it's Palmer or if it's not. This is very much a binary test. Is Palmer present? So for that, we decided to use CASP, which is competitive allele-specific PCR. Unlike normal PCR, which is two primers, this uses three. So you have basically a Palmer primer, a non-Palmer primer, and then a reverse primer. This is a piece of proprietary technology developed by LGC, but the overall cost per sample is somewhere around like seven cents per reaction. So even though it's proprietary, it still definitely is affordable uh, at an economic scale. So just to give you an example of how these markers look, say at the top is Palmer, at the bottom is uh, one of the other ones, let's say water hemp, and this is the SNP that is diagnostic. We design a primer so that it ends at the diagnostic SNP, and then it has a fluorophore tail, which is a fluorescent dye uh, that we're going to use for detection. And then down at the bottom for the non-Palmer sample, we do the same thing, but instead of using FAM, we use HEX. So these are our two signals that we're going to be reading. And of course, there's always a reverse primer. Run it on a standard qPCR machine, nothing uh, too fancy. This is the most specialized piece of equipment that you need. So most labs should be able to run it without any issue. And then let's see what the results look like. Well, how, I guess before that, uh, what are the error sources? Because whenever you do one of these types of diagnostic assays, you're looking at the error. So there's two main sources of error. The first is that 
the sample is polymer. It has a proper polymer genotype, but the assay just fails. That is, you put something in a wrong well, you make a concentration wrong, you sneeze in your sample. That's just quality control due to the individual working on it. The one that we're more concerned about is whether is when the uh, assay gives the correct answer, but the individual has a rare genotype. So you have a polymer that doesn't have the polymer SNP for some reason. So this one is particularly important because that means that the marker just doesn't work. So in order to avoid that, we did a lot of screening to make sure that our SNPs were present across a wide geographic area. All 20 of the populations of Palmer had these SNPs that we're using. So we did full validation in order to figure out, you know, just to make sure that this actually worked across all of these populations as well. So once we ran it, um, the output, as I mentioned, was based on two dyes. We have hex and we have fam. You can see the absorbance, uh, the emission values are around the X and Y axes here. And this is what the raw output looks like of a CASP assay. So you can probably see where this is going, but in order to actually make the call, we wanted to come up with a proper algorithm that wasn't reliant on human judgment. So basically each of those physical data points was given their own XY coordinates, um, pretty easy to generate that. And then we found the physical distances between the data points. And we used a method called hierarchical clustering to make the calling. So essentially data points that were close to each other were joined into a similar cluster. And we built a tree based on that. And we just continuously joined clusters with the closest cluster to them and kept going all the way up until everything was in a single tree. We know we're looking for either Palmer or not Palmer. So there's only two states that are actually viable. So we made a cutoff at two. And that basically determined if we had Palmer groups and non-Palmer groups. OK, so a little bit technical, but what's the output actually look like on the final product? Looks like this. So all of those red dots that you can see along the bottom, those are your Palmer samples. All of the yellow dots are non-Palmer. So that could be water hemp, but it could be any of the other species that we mentioned as well. And then, of course, down at the bottom left, the gray dots, those are your uh, non-template controls. That's just water to make sure that nothing amplified. So this is basically what you're handing off to a technician. They should be able to read this result without any real you know, specialized training. This is a lot easier to work with than some of the other techniques that are out there. And the DNA chemistry is a lot more robust. So we were definitely uh, very happy with the type of results that you can see here, but we wanted to actually you know, give good diagnostic criteria, give hard numbers to demonstrate it because that was just sort of qualitative. So we ran 1,250 individuals, um, and we were actually able to identify that two of our suppliers provided us with the wrong identification of their species. After we investigated that, um, this is an example of one of them. The markers that we designed were correct, and they were backed up by the morphology of the plants. So on the left, that is um, Amaranthus arenicola. You can see the leaves are much more narrow. And on the right, it was supposedly arenicola, and that is very clearly Palmer and our test identified it as such. So that was an early bit of good news that our, our test was working well when it was working better than the person who identified these things. But the actual performance, uh, we used what's called a confusion matrix, which is sort of a uh, table that shows the ground truth versus what the test actually says. So the ones that I've highlighted in green here are the correct calls. So Palmer identified as Palmer, non-Palmer identified as non-Palmer. And out of the 1,248 samples for this uh, marker, only three of them were bad calls. So very good performance. We got a true positive rate of 100%. That means when Palmer was there, we knew that Palmer was there. Uh, we designed, oh, we did this exact same thing for marker number two and marker number three, similar results. So I'll put them all together on a single plot and you can see our final accuracy values. Um, our worst performance was 99.76%. And we even had a marker that went up to 99.9. .9. So these tests that we ran were extremely, extremely strong. Uh, the errors that we got were one out of a thousand, two out of a thousand, that kind of thing. So that was for individual plants. That was just, you know, DNA from one leaf, make sure the marker works on that individual. The next step then was to expand this into bulk seed testing. So it's, it's one thing to just test something out in the field, but the introduction was through these contaminated seed mixes. And you get these tiny little black seeds. They look kind of like poppy seeds or you know, millimeter in size. You can't run, I mean, you can test each individual seed, but that's not practical. 
So we had to figure out if we could do multiple seeds at once and how many seeds could we run? Could we run 20 seeds at once, 50 seeds at once, uh, potentially more? So the underlying principle, we're gonna jump back to this real quick, is that if there is Palmer in your sample, if there's Palmer DNA present, it's gonna drive the data point to the right. And if there is non-Palmer DNA present, it's gonna drive your data point up. If you have a combination of both Palmer and non-Palmer in your sample, then you end up with something in this middle region here. So in order to implement this, really our question at this point is, how far can we push this test? How many seeds can we run? Can we run you know, 200 seeds and still detect one Palmer? So this is what it looks like once we tweak the primers a little bit and we started making uh, samples that were pools of seed. So uh, in black on the bottom, that is pure Palmer seed and in green is your pure water hemp seed. And then the orange and the blue are 1% Palmer contamination and 2% Palmer contamination. So if you were presented with this and you had to basically break it out into your three different groups, you can draw some lines pretty easily. And basically if it ends up in this middle region, that is a sample that is contaminated by Palmer DNA. So once we got that chemistry uh, working, we wanted to convert this into something you could do the actual statistical analysis on pretty simple. So we used an ArcTan transform to just turn it into a simple box and whisker plot. Uh, and you can see that all of these match up. Your water hemp in green uh, matches up with the position on this bottom left down here. And you can see that our, uh, our samples here in orange, that 0.5, that is one Palmer seed in a mix of 200. And the group here for water hemp versus that one in 200 seed are completely distinct from each other, very, very strong separation, and we can reliably call a one in 200 contamination level. Um, so we did the exact same test on all three of our markers. All three of them shows a very strong, significant difference between this one in 200 contamination level. And even our outliers that you can see here um, are still very strongly different than the water hemp samples. So the overall performance is that all three of those markers passed for uh, individual samples pretty easily. We had that 99.7 to 99.9% .9 accuracy. So for individual samples, this is easily deployable. For seed detection threshold, all three of them also passed very, very uh, clearly with one in 200 seed mix. Uh, performance, uh, yeah. our p-values for all three of those markers was less than 0 0.001. So if you're running the chemistry on this correctly, it will give you very, very reliable results. We also took all of these protocols, handed them off to a technician at Colorado State, who's an important part of our team. Uh, they had not worked on the project before. We handed them the instructions. They followed it, and they got the exact same results, 0 0.001. So we're confident that if we hand this off to a private lab, that they'll be able to implement the test results uh, with similar thresholds. So there are existing tests out there for Palmer Amaranth. Um, uh, University of Illinois most is probably the biggest one that's out there right now. Uh, what's the point of our test when those already exist? So those were based on a fairly limited number of uh, sequences that were available through NCBI which is something that you know, researchers submit it um, once they've done work on it, but you're sort of just limited on what people are willing to submit to the database. We generated a completely new set of GBS database from samples across the entire United States and native range and some outliers like South America and Africa. So we had a much, much better sampling than any other team did, which gave us a very, very large pool that we could filter out these private alleles that weren't actually diagnostic and let's get the best candidates for this test. We also validate against the largest population. So once we've designed these things, we ran them against things from across the United States and these other ranges that I mentioned to make sure that they worked. And in terms of the chemistry we're using, uh, the ones that are out there right now use Delta CT assays, which require a very, very specific amount of uh, precise calibration against the housekeeping gene. And because CASP is using competitive interaction of two different uh, dyes, you actually have a lot more leeway in terms of your concentration. Now, best practice is you always want to make sure you know what your concentration of DNA is. But if it's not perfect, this assay still works extremely well. 
You can also run it on very dirty DNA. If your sample's old, if it's degraded, um, I've run this on samples that were bright pink because of anthocyanins that were still present in the DNA extraction, still ran beautifully fine because the chemistry for this is really, really robust. That opens up a lot of opportunities to use this in labs that don't have maybe the highest quality technology or potentially using this in you know, DNA field extraction type approaches. All right, so what's the status of this test right now? Well, we actually completed all of the work. Uh, we reached the point where we are able to file a patent on this. The test is definitely commercially viable. The cost per unit test is low enough that we are looking into licensing it to private labs. Our uh, team over at Colorado State actually has a business unit through the school that they're gonna be uh, offering it, hopefully rolling it out this year now that uh, the patent's been filed. So they're just working on a few last minute um, inter-institutional agreements to get the last few details. So we're expecting to roll this out this year. Um, but the broader picture for something like this, I mean, we developed this for a problem that faces Minnesota, but Minnesota is not the only one facing these types of issues. Uh, a lot of different states are requiring genetic testing to prevent polymer from being introduced. Uh, all, all the way over um, in Washington state, for example, they don't have polymer, but they're implementing barriers to prevent polymer from being introduced over there. And they've directly reached out to us with questions about the stuff that we're developing. Um, so domestically, there's definitely uh, an interest in this type of testing and getting it out there. Um, there's definitely a market for it. But also there's this question of this international trade, uh, most notably China. When you're talking international trade, you're always talking China. Um, but they're concerned about introduction of Palmer and other weed seeds as well. And they started introducing a lot of barriers and filing a lot of complaints when things get through. So what direction are we able to take this? I mean, we, we developed a really cool test, but there's a lot more that we could do with it. So we're gonna look, um, go over some of the approaches we're talking about really quickly, expanding it to include testing the seed bank, testing other species and looking at herbicide resistances. So I mentioned previously, um, Palmer makes an absolutely massive number of seeds, you know, quarter million up to half a million depending on conditions. And these seeds remain active in the seed bank. Um, they're not the best seeds. They only last for about four or five years, but that's four or five years where Palmer can reemerge. So this is something that requires continuous monitoring. There's a lot of questions about, okay, we got the Palmer. Is it still an issue? You know, is it going to pop back up and ruin my crops two years from now? So the idea then is that we could potentially use this for um, seed bank testing. So just to give you an idea of the quality of this marker, I actually took worst case scenario DNA extraction I could think of. I just took a Palmer leaf, I ground it up in some buffer, ran that, and our marker still worked. So based on that, we could probably run this on samples that we just pull out of the soil as well. So this is something we reached out to a lot of crop consultants about, and they definitely had a lot of interest in this because they're already doing a lot of soil testing for um, you know, soil composition, um, nutrient load in the soil. So if you're doing that already, you're collecting the samples, why not use it to also investigate the weed seed load? And if we could figure out that Palmer's present, then we could basically use that to, you know, give the growers warning about what they're going to have to deal with the next year, which might be able to give them some heads up, change some of their planting practices, you know, uh, alter their herbicide strategies, might give them a little bit of push to talk to Forever Green about some of those wonderful cover crops you guys are all developing, right? Um, so this is sort of a real practical ground truth thing that we could easily adapt this to. Uh, there's also the question of these other species, uh, and specifically when you're looking at China in 2017, they issued complaints not just for uh, Palmer, but also for water hemp, uh, for the ragweed species, cocklebur, and also Johnson grass. These are ones that uh, you know, we could easily develop a test for if there's an interest in doing that because um, this was specifically, like I said, for soybean. This was, these were soybean exports. So we're going to be talking with uh, soybean. We actually just are pulling together a proposal for them, see if they're interested in developing tests under the same type of approach or using a different approach. Um, and then that, there's this question of the high throughput, because when you're talking about trying to push something out yeah, with the agronomic systems and making it economically viable, you have to put through a lot of things at a relatively low cost. 
you can't have somebody doing every single thing by hand. So the principle behind this is that if somebody has something that we would need to run these tests on, they sieve it down, which is a pretty simple approach, pool the seeds together, grind them out, and then we run through a genetic test to tell them if at least one seed is going to be flagged as being a contaminant. And that is enough that they're not going to be able to ship it. So the different approaches for this moving forward, what I just showed you today was the CASP approach, which is really good at identifying one species, but you can only run um, one set of CASP in a reaction because currently there is not the technology to multiplex uh, CASP. If you want to be able to run a similar test to this, but you want to be able to identify, let's say, five species from a single test reaction, at that point, then you're looking at some sort of a sequencing approach. Um, the other question then is this one of herbicide resistance. As I mentioned, polymer has a lot of different herbicide resistances. This is really common across a lot of weeds as well. Um, and being able to tell a grower, okay, not only do you have a weed, but that weed is resistant to glyphosate or that weed is resistant to PPOs or something like that is very, very uh, important actionable information that they could use in the coming year. So herbicide resistance could be potentially either target sites, like an amino acid substitution at a binding site in the protein, or it could be non-target site, which would be something uh, metabolic, for example. Uh, these are very, very different problems to have to solve. Target site resistances, though, are pretty well characterized. Uh, a bunch of PCR assays actually exist for these things, but it's not economically viable to test every single target site because there's so many of them. Uh, so PCR approach doesn't work, but we could potentially use a pull-down approach or a DNA bait, uh, as it's been called, to bind a subset of DNA that corresponds to these resistance traits. And then in that case, we would be doing targeted sequencing rather than entire shotgun sequencing. This would bring the cost for sequencing down and potentially make it economically viable. So this is a direction that we're considering pursuing. Uh, as far as uh, how doing the seed bake testing, um, what is the actual end user value? Because keep in mind, for all the work we're doing, we're tying this back to the growers because they're the ones who are actually impacted with this. And better knowledge of what's in a grower's field is information that they would absolutely love to have. They spend all their livelihood growing and working on these fields. They know it like the back of their hand, but there's things that they can't know. You know, you can't see what's in your soil necessarily unless you start going out and doing tests like this. So we want to give uh, growers, Minnesota and nationwide growers, sort of the, the ability to act uh, with all the information that they have available to them. So uh, we want to improve the efficiency of the herbicide application. There's no point in throwing uh, glyphosate out there if the stuff you're working at is resistant. You know, um, we want to give them the opportunity not only to better use the herbicides, but also to avoid using tillage because there's a lot of problems with tillage. And if you can avoid having to do tillage, that's fewer passes across your field. Uh, you can improve your profit margins by reducing both herbicide use and tillage, potentially through cover crops or potentially just through better targeting. And that will also help to improve the sustainability of these systems. Um, but not just their seed test, um, we're not just looking at seed soil bank testing, which is one of the major approaches. But the other thing is once we've pulled these samples out of the combine and they want to send it off to sell it, we could still use this type of approach to test that and make sure it's not contaminated. Certification of weed seed uh, status for agronomic products, particularly cereals, is extremely important uh, for uh, both domestic and export markets. Uh, USDA has a lot of guidelines that growers have to follow in terms of selling these things. And uh, if you've never seen traditional methods for identifying weed seed contaminants, um, it's, uh, it's very low tech. It is labor intensive. Uh, once you've done sort of the sorting, you basically have a light box and a person manually sorting is the main approach that's used right now, uh, which is why genetic testing is so important. And our end goal sort of, you know, down the line, this is sort of the best case scenario is this one shot test where you take your thing that you're concerned might be contaminated, you run it through our genetic assay and it tells you if it's contaminated with you know, species A, B, C, D, you know, however many of them we're testing. And the idea then is that you have this genetic test instead of a human test and you can say there's a lot more uh, confidence in your weed seed status 
as well as improving the overall reputation of agronomic products. Okay, uh, so I just want to give a, I'll address those questions in a second. Give a quick shout out to our con uh, contributors. This is a very, very large team, um, by the way. Uh, University of Minnesota, uh, you know, Don was the PI. With this. We were leading this project, but we had so much contribution from Colorado State because they developed a lot of the original concept work behind this. And basically they were the ones who told us about the, the approach of using CASP. And also want to give a shout out to um, Eric Patterson over at Michigan State who designed the initial marker that triggered all of this work. Uh, Jeff Gonzalez did a lot of great uh, work and provided a lot of um, good information from the extension perspective. And uh, Department of Ag, of course, gives a lot of important regulatory information. Um, and of course, the funding was made possible by the Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center and the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. And I can't believe I went through all of those names and pronounced them correctly for once. Um, and then with that, I'll go ahead and take questions. I know that we had some stuff that popped up in the chat, wherever it is. Yeah, Anthony, why don't you just go through those? And there was a, a hand raised and a few things in chat. Here we go, chat. <clears throat> uh, does Palmer, oh boy, does Palmer outcross? Uh, Yes, yes. Um, so within species, Palmer is an obligate outcrosser. Um, it's dioecious. That's part of what's driving a lot of these resistance traits that we're finding. Um, it, it just develops these things so quickly. There's a lot of genetic diversity. Yeah, they caught that. It is dioecious. Yes, it is dioecious. Um, within <laughs> the amaranthus uh, genus, some are dioecious and some are monoecious. Uh, Palmer specifically is dioecious. Uh, does it outcross with related species? Yes, uh, specifically Palmer outcrossing into um, water hemp is about a 1% success rate. It's pretty low, but it does happen. And we have seen herbicide resistance traits cross that species barrier under field conditions. Yeah, yeah. my question yeah. would be, does the uh, marker segregate away from the, uh, the actual Palmer uh, traits that make Palmer so bad? Yeah, so that is something that definitely needs some more uh, some more <laughs> investigation. The odd thing that I found is that uh, Palmer actually outcrosses with Monetia species and is still viable, which is very interesting to find. Um, <laughs> doesn't happen too often. Uh, there's only been like one or two reports of it, but so the papers are very interesting. Um, and the idea then is that our test that has developed should be able to identify those uh, those hybrids as well because they will have a combination of the two different um, DNA sources present in the hybrid. Uh, as far as long-term, if you get these established populations of hybrids, uh, that's not something that has happened yet. Um, definitely one of those threats that we're sort of keeping an eye on, but there's no basis for it at the moment. Thanks. Uh, could we expand the soil-based test? Potentially use a panel of different markers. Um, yeah, so as far as the soil-based test, the approach that we're considering right now is doing um, sequencing and then making a custom database to align against. Um, we currently have a proposal that we're putting to USB for that. And the underlying technology for all of that is pretty well established. And we think we could turn out a prototype of that within a year. So that's the approach we're gonna use. Uh, potentially we, you could use multiple markers. Uh, you could do like a multiplex type thing. Um, specifically, as I mentioned, CASP works really, really well for dealing with contaminants. But at the moment, because it's proprietary, <clears throat> there's no really good way to run multiple CASP reactions in one tube. Uh, we could potentially just run a set of markers as well for each one for each species. That would be another approach to it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <clears throat> how long would it take the cell testing labs uh, to get set up to run the assay? Um, depends on whether they're subcontracting or doing stuff in house. Um, so, specifically, are you talking about this Palmer assay or are you talking about the entire uh, the soil? Entire. <clears throat> what was that? The entire, the entire thing. Uh, 
Uh, first, we got to develop it. But once we've got it, depending on the chemistry we use, we would try to develop something that's pretty rapid to be able to turn around. Um, if it's like a CASP or PCR-based approach, they should have all of the tools available, and they just need to get the chemicals and the primers. That's the main strength of that approach. If you're doing a sequencing approach, it depends if they can do sequencing in-house versus if they're working with another company. But once again, this isn't necessarily novel in, in terms of the underlying <clears throat> principles. They should have a contract with somebody that they can outsource to or be able to sequence in-house. Um, so hopefully they can turn that around pretty quickly. Uh, the main thing is getting that database if you're doing the sequencing approach. Once the database has been designed, you just copy the database over. It's really easy to copy you know, computer data. We've been doing that for how much on uh, between research teams. Uh, and licensing agreements. I think that legal agreements are going to be the main thing that holds up a lot of this approach because lawyers have to earn their paycheck. <laughs> So if it's more of a sequencing approach, would you still do the DNA extractions in lab and then send it like to the sequencing facility? Yeah, well, that comes just like a soil mm -hmm. testing lab. Yeah, that comes down to a question of economic viability. Uh, you know, DNA extraction is can be done easily, easily in house. You can do the library prep for sequencing in house as well, mm -hmm. um, and it does reduce the cost, but. Uh, if you want to just get it all done and for some people it's worth it to pay a higher amount and just have it all done somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And part of the test is, and we're going to be working with a bunch of private labs. Um, I was actually just on a call with Minnesota Valley testing labs. Um, they're going to be doing sort of giving us feedback and doing some of the numbers to determine, is it worth it to do in-house versus subcontracting? Mm -hmm. Um, so in the coming you know, year, if this project gets approved, that is one of the things we're going to keep an eye on is how do we keep these costs down so that it's worth doing for the growers? Because economic viability is important. It's not just cool tech. For sure. Yeah. And not everyone, like we can extract DNA easily, but not everyone can. Right. Yeah, exactly. And DNA is probably the easiest technique for people to do. And that's a good way for them to cut costs. But library prep, for the sequencing, that is definitely a lot more intense. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Carmen Fernals. Uh, a couple of questions from an agronomic perspective. Uh, how soon uh, is the seed that's developed, how soon does it become viable? And uh, the other question had to relate, is it more of a cool season or a warm season? Weed. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's native to an area that is entirely in the warm season. So um, in terms of the germination, there's, there's some interesting work with the amaranth on germination and Palmer just has crazy high germination. So I would say it's a warm season, but it still gets over 90% germination when it's exposed to cool temperatures. Okay. Okay. It's tenacious. That, that's the best thing I can tell you about it, or and the worst thing, I suppose. But um, specifically for Palmer, the germination rate is extremely high, but it drops off very, very rapidly within three to four years. And, and, and the other thing is, uh, I'm thinking in terms of a, a non-chemical system, mm -hmm. like in, in soybeans, an organic system, uh, the, the pigweed, you know, it'll rise uh, above the uh, soybeans. And, and then starts producing seed. And I'm just concerned how soon it produces a viable, how soon that seed becomes viable because there is a new uh, weed management tool, this electronic zapping, and it works very well going over the tops of soybeans and, and totally kills the weed plant. But I'm concerned on how soon that seed is viable and shedding mm. before that operation can actually take place. Okay, so basically, when you go through with that and you kill the top of it, is the seed already viable when it falls? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I do not know the exact specifics of how long it takes to develop. Um, it's pretty quick, okay. but it does really depend on the environment, you know, um, how wet it is versus how and when it starts to dry out. Um, I was, is Devlin in the call? I don't see him. <laughs> 
he would probably be one who could give you more specific answer on that because um, sure. he's done a lot more of the physiology of it rather than just the genetics. Good. Um, but yeah, uh, I definitely want to know that too. So I'm going to make myself a note to bug <clears throat> Devlin about that. <laughs> Good. So well, Carmen, they're using the old sugar beet zapper, huh? <laughs> oh, it's it's one of the hottest items out there now for uh, weed management. Uh, in fact, we're going to be trying it this summer on our farm. Uh, <clears throat> and the main reason I'm really interested in because I want to see if we can deal with Canada thistle. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that you know, it, it was used for years and years and years in sugar beet production. Okay. You know, as, as a cleanup to reduce labor, uh, hand labor in the sugar beet system. Great. <clears throat> uh, oh, I have a question from Ratan. Um, Ratan, are you talking genomic regions or are you talking geographic regions? It's always fun when you hop between them. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about genomic regions because, I mean, you're trying to target like several different species and like mm -hmm. what's what's the tar like anticipate? Are you going to have like 10 targets from each species or each pest mm -hmm. or things like that? Because that could also affect your cost, right? At the end of the day, because right. you're trying to do your targeted resequencing. Mm -hmm. So the major cost there is like the primer cost, you know, when you start setting it up and, mm -hmm. and how many targets do you really need for the bulk testing? Do you need 10 targets from each species or do you need 500 targets from each species? And, yes, definitely. And then the other thing is also the, uh, the depth is gonna uh, influence that as well because you don't need more, you know, the more sequencing you do, the more expensive it is. So part of what we're doing is figuring out how many regions and what depth we need so that we can reduce the amount that we're spending mm -hmm. while still getting accurate results. And that is basically what is going to be a major part of the first year of the project is finding those parameters. Okay. Um, part of what we're using as a basis of that, though, is that um, Todd Gaines and Eric Patterson are part of the um, uh, International Weed Genomics Consortium, and they're already developing a database. They have one in the works. So we're going to be working with them to sort of figure out which, uh, how many regions we actually need. Um, but yeah, you're, you're asking the exact right question. And um, my, my response is hope USB gives us money so we can answer it. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Anthony. For all of the, uh, the organic farmers online, uh, we are in the process of coming up with a technology to measure iron resistance. Oh, oh, you made my day, Don. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little trickier, but we're, we're working on it. Uh, Collimator blades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, resistance to iron. <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> I, I have a question for you, Anthony. Mm -hmm. So, when you extract the DNA from the sea to measure the, the level of contamination, uh, have you extracted DNA from mixture of uh, palm or uh, soybean or palm and, and the corn, or you use the palm or seed and the uh, wild hemp or other grass seeds only? Yeah, so what, what that's, do you... yeah it's a very good question. Um, so we did not test against soybean and corn because those are very easy to filter out because of the massive size difference. And we looked to the existing tests that were out there and how they were validated. And um, sensibly, the tests were always conducted against water hemp because morphologically, they're very similar. When you're doing these screenings, you always get all the amaranth seeds falling out together. Um, and water hemp is the other one that's the most widespread. So we wanted to make sure our results were comparable with the things that are out there on market now. And that's why we decided to specifically stick with water hemp. Yeah, so the reason for that is uh, for soybean or corn, the size of the seeds is, is much larger. Well, mm -hmm. I, I never physically compare how large, it's much larger than the palmer seeds. And then my experience uh, to test the uh, contamination with the GM, seeds and the non-GM trees. And uh, if you have 1% to 5% as to the weight, as to the volume, et cetera, then mm. 
you compare the volume of Palmer seeds come with soybean or corn or other larger seeds, and we need a level, uh, high level of uh, Palmer seeds in order to be detectable compared mm -hmm. to the size. And that is a challenge when we want to find AP issue for the conventional uh, uh, cultivar, whether they contaminate with, with GM trees or any other uh, <clears throat> different uh, cultivars. And uh, they, we spend a huge amount of time to test different uh, combination or scenario. Mm -hmm. Here, that challenge will be since the, your seed is so small and uh, you have, uh, let me, one, uh, one pound of seeds with corn or soy contaminated with Palmer. I wondered what is the resolution? What is the sensitivity you use the marker to detect? Well, you'll separate the weed seed from the corn and soybeans, right? Yeah, so well, that's, you, that's you, our approach. Um, well, you, if you, you yeah, can't, go yeah, go ahead, sorry. Well, essentially, yeah, the, the underlying principle is when you have a really large seed, there's a ton of DNA present in there that's gonna come out if you extract it all together with the polymer and it'll just swamp out the signal. Yeah. Uh, we definitely recognize that's a problem. And our approach was just to take that challenge and move it to being an external problem of mechanical seed sorting before things get sent to us. Because there already is a whole protocol for when seeds are being tested. Um, and our approach is basically, you know, uh, we actually work with um, the Crop Improvement Association just to sort of see what they do, how they go through all the filtering and everything. Um, yeah. And the best approach really was pull the large stuff because passing something through a sieve is not a particularly uh, labor intensive approach compared to manually sorting. I, Get it down I, to the I, small I, stuff. Now, yeah. there's still that challenge because a palmer seed against a weed seed that's even Blotoides, which is another amaranth, is a substantially larger seed and has more DNA in it. Um, how will so the is, seed, yeah, how will the seed treatment affect the application of these markers? This, because they, they, when they do the seed treatment, myself uh, if, uh, did some seed treatment uh, by myself and uh, they will clean that seeds using the blow away of dust or other mm. contamination seeds and then they will coat the seed itself and uh, sell to farmers. Um, he wouldn't be sampling that seed, mm. right? So that wouldn't be, he's talking about sampling the seed at harvest. I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the last the question, for farmers, how will you compare? They use the UAV to detect uh, what seeds in their farmland after germination compare with uh, applied marker as to, the, as to the cost, as to the time to get the results. Yeah, so the, the main benefit to using this versus waiting for them to come out is uh, the preventative approach. You can use your pre-emergence, you can plan your whole regime for the upcoming growing season. You can do this, you know, during the, uh, during the winter, you can grab these samples if you wanted to and submit them. The, the idea is to give people a, a warning and the time to act upon that warning and come up with these integrated weed management systems that they need, um, as opposed to there's something over there on the ground that just came up, guess it's time to change what I'm applying to the field because it got through the glyphosate. Yeah, thank you. You, you did an excellent job to explain what the challenges are. Even I'm not a Palmer person, I know I follow <laughs> what you present. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, I have a also, question. Yeah, go ahead. So you have a, a a seed that has a, a fairly short lifetime, three mm -hmm. years, you said, something like that? Yeah, uh, MBA is doing checkups for five year period. After that point, they don't consider it a threat. Well, the question is, uh, since you can't kill it with uh, glyphosate and you don't wanna run over it with your tractor, um, you ever thought about um, treating it with ABA in uh, early seed development to see if you can, because you'd only have to extend the dormancy for a couple of years and you'd have a, an effective uh, solution to uh, um, having inviolable seed. And ABA is now made by Valent for agricultural production. So it's relatively cheap. 
Okay, interesting. Just a, just a thought that because that actually, if you hit soybean fields late in production with ABA, you probably have little or no effect. Maybe some advantage in terms of uh, water relations, but uh, um, but if you if immature seed actually would be delayed in, in germination by you know if you could delay it by two or three years, which isn't isn't unreasonable. Um, That's an interesting approach because part of getting these uh, technique, you know, these control efforts and making sure that they still work is making sure that you have something that the plant doesn't evolve a resistance to. And if a plant becomes ABA uh, resistant, they have other problems because it's an important part of the severe, actual Severe, severe, severe problems like yeah. precocious germination, that'd even be better. <laughs> I, or, uh, or, or just water relations in the field. Mm. So yeah, so ABA evolving um, resistance. I don't know if it'd work. I don't know anyone who's done yeah, that. Yeah, and I'm not going to say that it will not evolve a way to deal with that approach, but it would be more difficult for it to evolve a way to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, and and it may not be that you can delay um, dormancy that long by mm -hmm. treating it with ABA. I I have no idea, but uh, well, it's it an interesting idea me, though. You know, the you have to fight weeds smartly. Um, Don taught me that. Uh, and, and if, if you have that, you know, that's our Achilles heel, right? It mm. only, it's, it, it's not like the ones we had, the weed seeds we had in the Beale seed experiment where it went a hundred years in the ground, uh, it only lasts two or three years, four years then. That's the, that's the one thing that makes controlling Palmer, uh, much more manageable is the fact that these are crappy seeds. They have amazing germination rate, but they're not built to last and you know, if you can make sure that they are under control for those three years, four years, then the farmer's basically in the clear, uh, as far as that one introduction is concerned, at least. Okay, Anthony, are there any other uh, questions online at all? Any other comments? So I do want to uh, just make a, a quick comment about this slide you've all been staring at for the last uh, 20 minutes. This is not fun dip, even though it looks like it. Uh, this gives you actually a pretty good example of just how much uh, variation there is in the phenotype of uh, Palmer. This is the dry leaf extract, and you can see just how much variation there is in terms of the plant pigments in the leaf tissue. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that so you knew what you were looking at, because I thought this was a very nice picture. <laughs> So those are from across various uh, 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 biotypes, is that what you're saying? Yeah, different populations yeah. had very, very different coloration. Oh, cool. Well, uh, Anthony, thank you for a great presentation. Thanks for uh, bringing us up to date and relating to how your work uh, ties to um, uh, the development of the forever green crops and um, and how as we develop the forever green crops but make sure that we continue to think about their impact on weed populations and uh, weed uh, weed management within the agriculture systems in Minnesota so we appreciate all your work appreciate your presentation today and uh, thank you for having me and uh, also I will keep an eye out for any more cover crop work related to Palmer because I mentioned those two papers if I see any good stuff, I'll pass it along. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony.